one of the most influential Jewish leaders of our generation, Rabbi Lord Jonathan Zach. Friends, what a, an honor, a privilege, and a joy to be with you today. To pay tribute to one of the really great organizations of the Jewish world. While others talk, you do. While others curse the darkness, you light a candle. Your work has been outstanding in Jewish social services, in helping to build Israel, in campaigning for Soviet Jewry. You've been legendary. You touch more Jewish lives than any other organization in the Jewish world. And the proof is, you reached out to me with the wrong kind of accent. I'm not sure why you reached out to me. You might have heard I was a lord, so you thought I was from Downton Abbey. I'm sorry, but I wasn't. But I thank you for the generosity of your embrace. I salute your outstanding work, your incredible chairman, Michael Siegel, your CEO, Jerry Silverman, the whole amazing team that keeps this organization at the forefront of the Jewish world. And I give you a lovely blessing, the traditional blessing that Moses gave his generation. May God's spirit, his Shechina, live in all you do. Friends, your theme today for this conference is the world is our backyard. I have to tell you, the world today looks exactly like my backyard. A mess. <laughs> but there is no better place to start putting that right than here. And I want, as you look forward to this future, to share with you one simple idea. What will be the buzzword that people will associate with the 21st century? The answer is globalization. And for everyone else, that is the newest of the new. But for us, as Jews, it is the oldest of the old. For 20 centuries since the destruction of the Second Temple, even for 26 centuries since the Babylonian exile, Jews were scattered around the world. And yet they saw themselves and they were seen by others as one people, the world's first, the world's oldest global people, and we still are. I remember when I first became chief rabbi 24 years ago, long before the internet was really functioning, we went as part of the, it was then part of the British Empire to Hong Kong, and they presented me with a challah cover. There was nothing special about this challah cover, except that it was designed by a Russian Jew, living in Jerusalem, manufactured in China, distributed in Hong Kong. For everyone else, it was a challah cover. For us, it was the global Jewish people. Yet ask yourself, how did this happen? How could it be that before Facebook, Twitter, Google, a global people was even possible? Jews had none of the normal accompaniments of a nation. They didn't live in the same land. They didn't speak the same language of everyday speech. Rashi spoke French. Yudha Levi spoke Spanish. Maimonides in Cairo spoke Arabic. My Zayda spoke seven languages, all of them Yiddish. <laughs> they had nothing in common. They weren't part of the same culture. Rashi lived in Christian Europe. Rambam lived in Muslim uh, Egypt, the Middle East. They didn't share the same fate. While the Jews of Northern Europe were being massacred in the Crusades, the Jews in Spain were celebrating their golden age. In 1492, when Spanish Jewry was expelled, the Jews of Poland were enjoying their rare spring of tolerance. So what made them a nation? And the answer is a simple idea, one simple idea, as fragile as a feather, yet stronger than steel. It was this, Kol Yisrael Arevin 
All Jews are responsible for one another. As the Mechelt of the Rabbi Shimon Bar Chai puts it, all Jews are Kiish Echad, the Guf Echad, like one person with one body, Echad Mehem Loke Kulamargishim. When one Jew is injured, all Jews feel the pain. And I remember when I first saw the power of this idea. I used to, as Chief Rabbi to make every year a television program for the BBC. And in September 1999, they asked me to make it in Kosovo, where the NATO, where the NATO action was just coming to an end. I went and I interviewed the head of the NATO forces, General Sir Michael Jackson, the other Michael Jackson, not the moonwalking <laughs> one. And he said to me, I, I was stunned by this, he said to me, we owe your people a great debt. I said, how? He said, there are 300,000 refugees coming back. What is the sign that life has returned to normal? The answer is, when the schools open on time. Your people are running all the schools in Pristina. They made sure the schools opened on time. When I left him, I made inquiries. How many Jews are there in Pristina? The answer came back, nine. How was it that nine Jews in Pristina were running the entire country's educational system? The answer is, if, you've got a, if you're a Jew, you have a mobile phone. It was invented especially for the Jewish people, so we could yachna together. And here it is. You get on a phone in Pristina, you make a few phone calls, and that there is the joint. There's World Jewish Relief, there's Israel. All of a sudden, you've got the whole Jewish people coming together in Pristina to run the schools. That is the power of Kol Yisrael Arabian Zebazer. The human brain is small, yet it is the most powerful computer in the universe. Why? Because of the number of connections in the brain, the number of synapses, neural pathways. The Jewish people may be small, but we are hyper-connected, and that is what makes us great. So that is my challenge to you. Take the Jewish community in America and build those connections around the Jewish world and make it truly a global Jewish people. Now you might ask, how on earth do we do that? Given that we are so divided and fragmented and disunited as a people, Religion, Judaism, that used to keep us together for the past two centuries, has divided us. Israel, which always united us, now sometimes divides us too. And the answer is very simple. For us, disagreement isn't a problem. Disagreement is what it is to be a Jew. Yesterday in Shul, we read about how Abraham Avinu argued with the Almighty. So did Moses, so did Jeremiah, so did Job. On every page of the Talmud, you find Rabbi X arguing with Rabbi Y. I once did a public conversation with the Israeli novelist Amos Oz. He began by saying, I don't think I'm going to agree with Rabbi Sachs about everything, but then on most things, I don't agree with myself. <laughs> Elie Wiesel once said, God created human beings because he loves stories. I say God chose the Jewish people because he loves a good argument. <laughs> Friends, what we need is not agreement. Don't worry about agreeing. We disagree better than anyone else in the world. What we need is not agreement. What we need is Kal Yisrael, Arabian Zebazer, that feeling that we are all connected to one another, we're all responsible for one another. I don't need you to agree with me. I need you to care about me. And let us clearly say, let us clearly say, and let us mean it, every Jew is precious to me. Every Jew is my brother or my sister, and that is what makes us the Jewish people. Friends, we are living in an age in which instantaneous global communication was made for the Jewish people. It abolishes distances between us. It is made for a people which is tiny and yet scattered and distributed throughout the world. Let us decide, here and now, to take this gift from heaven, courtesy of Sergei Brin and Mark Zuckerberg, 
Let us take this bright gift and use it to make these connections between Jews across the world. Let us think of ways of doing things nobody ever did before. Let us create a universal, free Jewish education by creating an open Jewish day school on the internet. Let us create an open Jewish university on the web. Let us build a Jewish tent so that every Jew everywhere from here to Ukraine to Hungary to Sderot can enjoy the best Jewish minds, listen to the best Jewish stories and be inspired by the best Jewish music. Let us use the web to initiate a global Jewish conversation so that our arguments can bring us closer together instead of splitting us apart. Let us make the Jewish people whole again. There is no other Jewish organization in the world that could do it better, more effectively, or more graciously than JFNA. And I say to you, go out and connect the Jewish world. Friends, I know we have problems. We have many problems as a people. We have Israel isolated, anti-Semitism in Europe, the Pew Report, etc., etc. But I tell you, with Jewish ingenuity, you can solve even the most seemingly insoluble problems. And I'm going to prove this to you by telling you a story, one of my favorites, and with this I end. It is said in 1947 when, as you remember, relationships between the British mandatory power in Israel and the Israelis, the Jews, was not great. How can I put it? It wasn't great in 1947. <laughs> and uh, Chaim, who's a Moshevnik, is caught by the British and imprisoned in Akko for gun running for the Haganah. He is sitting there in the British military prison and his wife, Kenya, writes him a letter. She says, Chaim, it's all very well for you to go and be a hero for the Jewish people, but meanwhile we have a farm to run and I have a field to plow because now is the time to plant potatoes. How am I going to do it if you're in prison? The next morning, Chaim sits down and writes Chenya a letter. He says, Dear Chenya, don't touch the ground. There are rifles buried underneath. The letter is intercepted by the British military authorities. The next morning, the farm is overrun by British soldiers. They dig up every single inch of the ground. They do not find one single rifle. Disconsolate, they return to base. The next morning, Chaim writes, Kenya, now plant potatoes. Friends, now